We welcome you to our service this morning. Um, we're running a little late, and uh, several things. We're acutely aware of one thing. The devil doesn't like this service to go ahead. And we've had all kinds of issues in the past with computers and whatever. Uh, today, uh, I've already had a phone call right after church. i got to go to jail. Um, I didn't do it. Uh, but I have to be there. Uh, Karen's got to deal with her mom. She's been dealing with her mom this morning already, and we're a little late for that. It came, and the snowplow hadn't hit the parking lot yet, and we're out there cleaning up and doing whatever. So we uh, trust you uh, share that concept with us. The devil does not want you to hear what we're saying, and uh, he does not want you to worship God, does not want you to say, thanks, God, for saving my soul. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're acutely aware of. We trust you're with us, and uh, we'll do put together our service now, starting off with some kids' songs. And uh, so let's go with the first one. Gone, gone. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Yes. And uh, here's some nice sheep. The Bible idea of cattle was sheep, goats, anything you wanted like that. It's not a specific word. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and for little folk and whatever uh, in the world as scary as it's getting uh, he'll take care of us and all those things because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills but it's important that this next song is true in our lives our sins are gone because we've had Jesus take them away gone, 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 gone yes my sins are gone now my soul is free and in my heart's a song buried in the deepest sea yes that's good enough for me I shall live those little people's uh, uh, education up over the weekend uh, like learning to practice your letters okay well we've had a busy week um, Bob Nicholson got older this week 89 I think the <laughs> I said to him I walk in the room and there's a couple of balloons 89 and tied together and I said so how old are you <laughs> I said, oh, joy and I see I'm not technical and um, anyhow Bob's in hospital and so good morning Bob if you're listening in we want to sing happy birthday to you Ramsey had a birthday yesterday and uh, I don't know if he can reach us at home but uh, happy birthday to him and uh, what else uh, Bob and Bobby had an anniversary so anybody else have a birthday we know of nobody nope 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 okay well good well, uh, there we go. Happy birthday to you at home. Here's our song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Only one will I do. Born again through salvation. How many have you? So the question for you to answer is how many have I got? You're obviously born in your parents' family. That's how you got here. That's how you're listening. And the second one is, is where we have a uh, relationship with Jesus through his son, uh, God's son, Jesus, relationship with him. We're born again and added to his family. Okay, well, we'll leave you those thoughts to think. We're going to turn for some worship songs now. And um, we've come into his house and gathered in his name. There's uh, three of us here putting together the service and two church mice. And uh, so, uh, but if you're at home, uh, still, if you're sitting there watching, sing along with us. And uh, the house is, the church here is not the church. The church here is just the, the covering over the church that's worshiping together in small number to present for you. You're the church if you know Jesus. Thank you. 
to number one if we can, Karen, and uh, Glenn's Majesty, if we could, please. We have time. We'll put an extra chorus in there. Those are short. And um, we will sing Majesty. Worship His Majesty. some announcements if we can and uh, what's going on uh, not a whole lot <laughs> but anyhow we, the, the youth are blessed to still have their program on Friday nights Josh is running that and he's got a few helpers uh, that help him out with that the adult helpers have to be double vaxxed if they're going to be and um, helping out but anyhow that program's still running Mickey's place after school is running in there as well in the same rules and uh, Pauline and Josh are there uh, most days and take care of uh, that situation uh, we heard on Friday nothing has changed regarding the uh, churches and whatever we're carrying on indefinitely, but at least through the Christmas season, we're told. So um, plan for that. Uh, I guess Red Sweat Service is going to be uh, just a, a few uh, folks putting it together, and there will be. So that's the plan as of now. But uh, anyhow, again, uh, it's God's work, it's God's business, and it's God's problem. And uh, so if you get your head around that, it's a whole lot easier for us to then enter into our first hymn. Uh, and uh, uh, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Um, you know, there's lots of hurt down south right now, whatever, but we're so blessed here. We got food, and Prince George we're here that doesn't have much in, in other places. But uh, in all things, uh, and as we've preached before, that preacher that said when his wife was struck by lightning on their honeymoon and for 32 years, uh, lived and he was never more than two hours away from her. He makes this statement, God is incapable of giving us anything but good. I really didn't like the nine inches or ten inches of snow we got yesterday, but I got good exercise, and uh, that was fun. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let's just sing together. To God be the glory.
Our Father, we bless you for the words of such a great hymn you've inspired this writer to write. Uh, to God be the glory, great things he has done. The freshness of the snow always reminds us of your holiness and your purity. Come now and let us reason together, the Lord says in Isaiah, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Taken away, washed, clean, forgiven, buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. Uh, behind your back, out of sight, blotted out. Father, we bless you for the great things you have done in the work of redemption uh, on Calvary's cross. Jesus cried, it is finished. And he gave his spirit into your hands. And so, God, we celebrate today uh, an empty tomb, a risen Savior, and one who is seated at your right hand, uh, ever living to make intercession for us and never looking in on the affairs of your children and uh, watching over us as we saw in the story of Stephen, how he, he stood up and uh, Stephen is dying, being stoned to death. And he says, I see the Lord standing at the right hand of the Father and looking in on Stephen's affair. And then Stephen, we're told, falls asleep. Such is the glorious things you do in the lives of your children. We bless you for that. And Father, in our town these days, there's been so much death. A little lady died, and we had her celebrate her life yesterday, and uh, others have died, and just uh, Val and uh, the Walker clan has lost somebody, and the Davis clan's lost two, and, and uh, the Cardinal family has had losses, and uh, Lord, there's a little girl, Lynn Dempsey in Vancouver, uh, struggling, fighting to stay alive. And we ask God, by your grace, you would draw near that you would touch her little body and raise her to health and strength and give her back to her family and friends here and her little girl. Uh, be with her. We'll commit her care to your keeping and ask your blessing on her. We ask God your mercies to be upon uh, Bob in hospital and Bobby with her legs and whatever. And even Grandma this morning having struggles, just help with that. And uh, give grace and help to your father. Father, we ask your mercies to be upon uh, the Abbotsford story and from there to hope and the shut down. And we thank you that Brady can be down there and hope and helping out because we know he's that kind of nature. So uh, let your grace be upon his heart and encourage him and Ruthie there with Working out in the church that's done so much in that area through this time. Bless that church for your goodness and love. Father, pour out your blessing in these days, but our community here for people who care not about the things of God. That Jesus is nothing but a swear word. We pray, God, your spirit would take and prevail upon hearts and break hearts. And when they might do, say those things, that you would deal with their hearts and humble them before yourself, O oh God. Help them to understand that your very, their very breath is in your hand and that they need to repent and come to know you in a personal way. So we ask God for an outpouring of your spirit to that end these days and, and be with those who are discouraged because of the lockdown, but help them to know that this is your work, this is your cause, your plan. They have their Bibles, they have the Word, they have uh, computers, they can listen to this message. We ask God to encourage them to just spend time with those they can and uh, be blessed together, O oh God. So I pray your mercies upon our time as this Word goes forth in our community here on the radio and also then uh, on the YouTube. We ask your grace to use it. Uh, we cast it upon the water, O oh God, and you've promised it. We'll find it after many days, bring results, bring help and blessings to people's lives, we pray. So receive our thanks and meet with us in this small hour. We ask your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's, uh, Glenn, up your, put up the... Um, gift giving program if we can <laughs> the gift giving program it's coming towards christmas i guess for evelyn we better have some christmas carols next week so uh evelyn uh, will be watching and expecting some we'll have christmas carols next week okay plan that uh prayer request well, one prayer chain at gmail.com and uh f phone that in there or text in there prayer requests and uh, uh we have some prayer issues uh the uh, gloria um, is uh, in Vancouver with her baby that she had a while back and it has to have a surgery, I think a heart surgery or something like that on Tuesday. So uh, pray for that situation if you would um, and we'll keep you kind of posted as we can. Um, so pray for that. Um, and then uh, for finances, uh, that we're changing from Pris, Baptist at Pris.ca. It's, it's getting over to ChetwinBaptist at gmail.com and if you can just make that note if you're a giver there and help her with that. Uh, we're thankful for all the givers that continue to support and help the work go ahead and whatever. So um, we're, we've got to keep the lights on, but uh, we are 
uh, just glad for those who are we touched by our, by the Spirit of God. We we don't need your finances because uh, God doesn't need. We, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns those mines around here, uh, and uh, so He takes care of the finances. But He uses people uh, to do those things, and so we're thankful for your support as God uh, blesses your heart and, and, and gives you that opportunity. Um, there's a search for Chetwin Baptist Church, and uh, if you want to listen in and to our sermons and whatever, uh, that's all on there. Okay, uh, no other announcements made this week, Glenn, of anything that people need to know about? Okay, yep. uh, just keep praying for Abbotsford's story situation and praying for that Lindsay girl, uh, Lynn, Lynn Dempsey, a girl that's um, uh, got COVID, a, a strange uh, Delta variant one, and she's on a breather uh, machine down in uh, Vancouver. She's about 35-ish, I think, and got a little seven-year-old girl and husband here. So we'll pray for that situation. Okay, let's go to uh, our screen and uh, have a, another uh, song. Uh, just with all the, the, the pain and sorrow in our community, and it might be for your heart that as we have uh, um, s- s- shutdown continuing. Uh, for those tears, the Lord knows them. Uh, remember Psalm 56? I got your tears in a bottle, dated and timed as to what they were about. And that's the greatness of our God and His great love. So uh, when we have tears, He's noticing. That's what He wants us to know. So let's uh, sing this song together. time in the word we trust you enjoyed that singing <clears throat> we have another song before we finish but um had a an interesting week and uh things uh i've been working at the back here uh, glenn was asking when the next guest preacher is going to be but uh i've uh, worked on series for the christmas season 
And um, next week is the first Sunday of Advent, so we'll sing some Christmas carols and whatever and um, do that. But we're working hard with that. But people come through the doors and visit and uh, come in with issues and whatever. We're, we're thankful and glad for that. But uh, um, I went home early the other day, and it was Karen and Reese, and they were making Christmas cards, uh, handmade Christmas cards. So if you get a card from, uh, from us, um, and uh, I don't know if it's, a, I thought it was kind of a dying thing, but maybe with COVID actions, uh, it'll come back and people will have time to do those kind of things and whatever. Um, anyhow, they uh, making these really nice cards, and they're, they're doing the painting work and artwork on them and everything like that. So uh, uh, I don't know if they're signing them on the back, if you get one. Um, I don't expect to, but I get to see them around the house. <clears throat> So uh, Christmas cards and uh, whatever. Um, I, was, I was working on some thoughts came this week, and actually out of, out of the message last week, uh, something came, and I was uh, looking, and I, and I run across this verse, and it kind of triggered me from there on to make this message. And um, uh, we want to consider some thoughts that are better than a, than a homemade Christmas card. Better than a homemade Christmas card. And uh, it's, it's the, if you ever considered the writing, the idea from the scriptures, the writing by the finger of God. The writing by the finger of God. And uh, that's a, a very special uh, section of uh, thinking there, the writing by the finger of God. And so we want to consider that this morning, uh, uh, the writing by the finger of God. Let's ask God's help to do that, and we'll carry on. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Um, you, are, you are all about instruction. You are all about understanding. And uh, you say, be not drunk with wine, where there's revelry and debauchery. Uh, but be filled with the Spirit where there's understanding and help. And we need your Spirit to understand your Word, and we thank you for your Word. And as we look at this subject of the writing of the finger of God, that, Father, our hearts would be encouraged and uplifted and strengthened. So meet with us and help us, we pray, as we listen to these things. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing we want to consider this morning, and we know the writing of the, the, the uh, writing of the, by the finger of God is the reference. If you, if you don't, if you're going to get it. Exodus 31, verse 18. And said, this is God talking to Moses. And when he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets. And uh, they're not tablets for his headache or whatever. They're two tablets of stone. And you see the picture of them with the Ten Commandments. And uh, the tablets of stone. And then it says, written by the finger of God. The finger in the Hebrew word is kind of a funny word. It says, according to Strong's, it says it's to seize. Uh, it's, it's how do you word it there? He says, uh, um, something to seize with. Something to seize. And so your fingers seize something off the plate, a sausage, a pepperoni sticks, and whatever. I had one for breakfast. Uh, and you seize those things. So your fingers are Caesars and uh, uh, whatever. But uh, when he had finished speaking with him, uh, he says he wrote these things by the finger of God, uh, these, these tablets of stone. Um, we don't have those out there, I don't think it's good, because even the ones that we're, we'll do about the rewrite. Um, but, you know, man has always looked for something to worship that's concrete like this rather than the idea that the book tells you about somebody who is spirit and lives within us and somebody who uh, uh, offers to us eternal life in relationship with himself in the spirit world, uh, most of all of importance. Uh, he takes care of all the physical. He's interested in all the physical. You don't have a tear that drawns down your face. He's not interested. My Bible says that. He knows that. And he cares for you, Psalm 56 says. He, all those things. But he's a God who is a spirit. And he lives with us in our, in our hearts by his spirit. And he cares for us. But he gave us the word of God written by his finger uh, in a very physical way because the writing was in that rock. And uh, again, he didn't have to take a finger. He can just speak the words and what everybody tells us. It's written by the finger of God. And so that's the first thing. And uh, the, the word write is to grave. And uh, the Hebrew idea is to grave, to carve on the stone. And so you go to the tombstones at the cemetery and I spend a little time there. And you see names carved in stone. And they can do all that wonderful stuff stuff and uh, here this this passage that was what was given to Moses was carved engraved by the finger of God we are told and uh, so that is uh, quite interesting uh, to my mind uh, to focus on that that God actually took time and and they say wrote this out and then he gave it to Moses we see the story we know the story or you can read it in Exodus 32 and uh, Exodus uh, other passages there 32 and on um, so Exodus 32, that same, uh, the next chapter, uh, we want to see that what he said was real. 
And, and so we, and God, you know, review and stuff like that is, is important. When God says something, did I give you Exodus 32? Yep, I did, 15 and 16. Here we go. It says, Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written from one side and, and on the other, and they were tablets. The tablets were God's work. They were God's work. This is God's book. And God's book, God, the message of the book is what's the important part, not whether you, you we don't worship the book. Mine's covered in, in uh, chamois cloth. Uh, Karen did a good job on that for me. Uh, that's chamois cloth. Um, they, they make bond leather. They make all kinds of fancy things you can have on your car. But it's not the book that we worship. It's the one that the book is about. We worship. And so he wrote these things there on both sides. And the tablets were God's work. And the Bible is God's work. And the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. And so he gives you back. He said that back that chapter. He does it again. I want you to know this is for real. And the word of God is real. The word of God is alive. The word of God, the, um, it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. A doctor uses a scalpel and he, and, he, and he cuts and he takes things out and he goes in and fixes things and whatever with that and sews you back up and whatever. But this is the Bible in the spiritual sense. It's sharper than that. Some people sadly use the Bible as a sword. They like to slash and burn and cut people down. Well, the Bible says that uh, you're divorced. Well, God hates divorce. And they take it all out of context. And they use the Bible as a sword to slash and cut and maim and hurt. But the Word of God is a scalpel. And he takes and he cuts away things from our lives as we read it. And that's why it's so important. We say, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, pray every day. And you'll grow. And it'll help you to know uh, you'll have answers when those guys come slashing and burning with their sword. And that's the saddest part of my work when I have to go to sit with somebody because someone else slashed and burned them down with, chopped them down with the Word of God and uh, hurt their spirit and left them. You're supposed to hang, lift up the hands that hang down and people just want to go and cut you off at the knees uh, and, and just destroy this is God's work, he says, and the writing was God's writing engraved on those tablets, and it's very real. The Word of God is very real to us. So then Exodus 32, a problem enters. Exodus 32, 19, we have written there, and it came about. Moses comes down the mountain, and as, as, Moses, as soon as it, Moses came near the camp, that he saw the calf, the golden calf story. Is that right in that story? Moses is up on the mountain and whatever, and the golden calf is made while he's gone. They say, oh, what happened to that man, Moses? And, and he, uh, he, he's gone. Well, we better do something. Let's, and they somehow got a whole bunch of gold, everybody's earrings and whatever. And, uh, it was just, and they put all this gold in the fire, and they threw it in, and out come this calf lied. You can't throw a bunch of gold in the fire and it comes a calf. Well, this devil's help for sure. They lied. They formed it. They molded it into a calf. And they said, oh, Israel, here's your God. Moses comes down and has heard this and whatever. And he's been told this and we'll come back to that. And Moses' anger burned and then he threw the tablets from his hands and he shattered them all over the floor. He smashed those two tablets that were written by the finger of God, front and back. The law of God. And he shattered them the mountain what's the lesson it's simple man's sin breaks the command of God man's sin breaks the commands of God that's what sin is if we don't have a law people say I, I didn't know sin until I, until I knew the law and the law brings us what if you don't you know in our land uh, ignorance is not a defense in court I didn't know the speed limit was a hundred it wasn't a hundred through town uh, well, you didn't know that, but uh, uh, one guy stood before a judge one day, a friend of mine, and uh, he says, well, I, I didn't know that. I guess I'm dumb. And the judge says, well, I guess you're legally dumb because you're really going to be uh, legally fined uh, for what you were doing. He would some do it again. <clears throat> Beloved, uh, ignorance is not a, a defense in court in our country. But here these people, they, they, they live their life and uh, they, they broke the command of God. Why? Because of their lust for, for a concrete type of thing they could see and fall down before. Moses is gone because he kept them from that. Uh, the, the fire was aglow and the, all those things were there, but they got this off track here and they broke the commands of God and Moses physically broke them because of his anger. And we'll touch on that. So uh, man's sin breaks the commands of God. Physically, they were smashed. And they had broken them already spiritually and intellectually. Uh, they had broken this uh, laws of God. 
And so uh, we see here what happened. Well, Moses was, Moses' anger burned. Moses' anger burned. Well, uh, for several reasons, first off. Um, 32, verse 10, and what we have there says, Now then, let me alone. That my, This is God talking to Moses. Now then, and God's already told him. Uh, we'll come back to that. But uh, how what's going on, why he's mad here. He says, Now then, let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. This is God talking to Moses. God, Moses, I'm just going to destroy them all, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You know, we, we had Adam. And then we wiped it out to eight people with Noah. And we got Noah's land, whatever. Never mind. I'm going to start and just with you and your wife and, and I guess maybe Aaron in there and whatever. I'm going to make a great nation of you. Just stand back and I'll do this. And then Moses entreated the Lord as God and said, Oh, Lord God, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying with an evil intent, uh, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? And the Egyptians are going to be laughing, God, at you if you, if you do this. Uh, they won. They, th they wanted to come and kill us. Well, you just took us out in the desert and let us die. They're going to say that. And, and beloved, this is called reasoning with God. It's called reasoning with God. That's how we pray and we reason. And he's arguing with God, God, if you do that, th this is what the world is going to see. And he's not being smart, Alec. He's not being cheeky. He knows that God can squish them like a bug. With evil intent, they brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger, God. Please, he's begging. And change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? Your servants to whom you swore by yourself that to them that I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. Moses is missing one small detail and people often do that with theology. Moses, you're of the lineage of Jacob and family. Uh, so the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Our God is a reasonable God, and our God likes for us to come and wrestle with him in prayer. Jacob did that. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your, your servants, you swore to them? But Moses is forgetting. I can do that all with you, Moses. Your same fulfillment of that prophecy he says, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Um, you're uh, up further there, the Lord says. If you notice, he says here, his people. And uh, my anger is burned against them. Uh, let me alone, and I will make uh, my anger, let my anger alone. There's a discussion in those couple of chapters in there about whose people these people of Israel are. Moses says, God says to Moses, they're your people. And Moses says, they're your people, as he does here. And uh, uh, then they, they get to the point later on where they just discuss and call them this people. Just neither one of them wants to claim ownership of them. This people is, uh, is evil continually. Moses' anger um, causes him to destroy. But he's angry because he's already had to talk God down from destroying the people. And now he walks down the mountain and he's angry so mad. He smashes God is right. Everything he said was true. And he smashes the... Uh, the things there. Verses 7 and 8, please, Glenn. And here's the people's sin being portrayed. The Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Uh, your people, he says there. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, to, to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. This is why God was mad. And now Moses has heard what God had said. He goes down, and it's true. And his anger flares up, and he smashes those commandments written by the finger of God. Moses' anger acted out. Our New Testament says this, Ephesians 4 and uh, uh, 26. And it says, be angry, and yet do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger. So God says there's, there's a place for anger. Uh, it should be controlled. It should be generated as, as something that's uh, it's a real issue. Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't get angry about everything. You need anger management if you do that. And uh, uh, such. I, I got to guard that. Uh, I don't do pets messing in my yard or whatever. And I was outside the church and there's a pet mess. <laughs> uh, be angry yet do not sin. He says, and don't let the sun go down on your anger. And the reason why, he says, do not let this anger happen and carry on. Here's your next verse, verse 27. And it says, and do not give the devil an opportunity. You see, if your anger is accepted and you can justify it and it's real, and there's things to be real angry about, 
But that anger always must be controlled. Grabbing and spanking a child when you're angry is not a smart move. You'll always lose that child to social services. You can't do that. Be angry and don't sin. Be concerned about situations and don't sin. And do, but be careful that you do not give the devil an opportunity. And he watches if he can see your anger and see your uh, whatever. And he just likes to fan. Have a little gas and have a little touch of this. And, and let me fan that flame a little bit. Yeah, you have a right to be angry. Oh, yeah. There's no right for that person to do that to you and whatever. And don't give the, the devil an opportunity, Paul says. And Moses had lost his temper. And he broke those things that God had given him by written by his finger. And uh, smashed those. Um, quite a story about the writing by the finger of God. Um, he uh, comes along and angry spiritually and upset and the people had pushed him to that point but his anger acts out and Paul reminds us in the New Testament be careful, be careful well now it's time for a rewrite a rewrite, he smashed the commandments now, there they are, broke all over the ground written by the finger of God front and back Moses smashed them on the ground <laughs> you just, you think uh, we, we've been there, have you not been there Something you did something, whatever and you slam your hand on the table and then table if something fell off the table and broke or whatever uh, those are things they're just dangerous stuff be careful because the devil's looking for an opportunity to destroy you with that anger there's a rewrite i'm hearing a funny noise here there's a rewrite of the of god's work exodus 34 verse 1 starts talking about the rewrite now the lord said to moses cut out for yourself Two stone tablets like the former ones. The one, you know the ones you broke? Yeah, just like that, please. Cut out two. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So Moses, you cut some tablets. You cut them and I will write on them. Okay? And so uh, that's the plan. Uh, I think in verse 2, uh, I didn't give you that glimpse. Verse 2 says, and have it done by morning. <laughs> so and Moses is up burning the midnight oil, carving out these two tablets of stone and whatever. How big they were, what they were made out of, sandstone or what, I don't know. But they were obviously easily shattered. They weren't granite. And uh, he uh, has to have, the, I think verse 2 says that he has to have them done by morning. But here we have, it says, so, so be ready by morning and come up the mountain in the, morning, in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. So bring these things up the mountain. Okay, and I, but you remember, pay attention to that verse 1. I will write on those things. Okay, I will come up there. Well, now, when you're going through this passage here uh, of God writing on the stones and tablets, you have to jump back between a couple of places. And the Bible is one, and God is one, and His Word is one, but He doesn't tell you all the story in detail at one point, and another place He adds more in. And so we have Exodus 34, 1 is the plan. You make some stones, you bring them up the mountain, I will write on them, God says. Okay? Now, Deuteronomy 10, 3 and 4 makes this. So I made an ark of acacia wood. He says, now I want you to make a special box to keep these in, and whatever. And, and, uh, table, and, and cut out two tablets of stone like the former ones. And he went up the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets like the former writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. So he goes up the mountain and says, he's got the two tablets. And he wrote on the tablets like the former ones, the Ten Commandments of God. So he's written the Ten Commandments, Okay. This is the finger of God has done this. He comes back up. He does the rewrite, okay? Um, but that's not the end of the story. There's the plan. The plan was that he would cut out the stones and bring them up the mountain. The act is he gets up there. God writes on the Ten Commandments, but he wants on there. Now back to Exodus 34, 27 to 28, and here's what we have. The Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, and he did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant uh, of the Ten Commandments. The covenant of the Ten Commandments. God wrote the Ten Commandments. Well, commandments. Remember we say about the Ten Commandments? Somebody said, well, I haven't broke the Ten Commandments. You say, well, what are they? You don't even know what the Ten Commandments are. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. And the very first one, you shall have no other gods before me. And, and people fail that one so miserably all the time. God wrote the Ten Commandments. And he says, Moses... Yeah, remember it was written on both sides? Yeah, the commandments weren't that long. You get to write on these ones here. And so Moses, for 40 days and 40 nights, had to do lines. Glenn, did you ever have to write lines in school? Never. Boring. Karen? No? Any church mice ever have to write lines at school? 
Somebody just went like that. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I had to write lines as a girl one day. My brother and I got, he got in a fight, and I got just joined in. And he hit somebody with a rock, just digging somebody who was on the swing, and he threw a rock and hit this guy, and the guy was mad, and I jumped in and started throwing rocks. And we had two weeks sitting in school, every lunch hour and every recess. For two weeks, we sat and uh, we played outside, and we stayed in, and there was a whole bunch of lines attached to that punishment. Uh, back in the day when you could do that, you stayed in, you didn't go outside two weeks, and uh, the other guys only got a week, I think, and then we got two, uh, my brother and I, and wrote a lot of lines. Well, Moses had 40 days and 40 nights of writing lines. And just to help you, if you're used to writing lines and whatever, my, my son used to, I will not do something. He'd make I all the way down the page like this and then fit the rest of it in and, and whatever. Uh, God does a rewrite. There's a plan, the act. Uh, Moses sums up, he gets right, right on there. And then the extra assignment, Moses writing lines. I like a detention. There he got it. And then, so this is so important, this writing with the finger of God. They're getting ready 40 years later to go into the promised land. And guess what? God comes along and he does a little review. And so Deuteronomy 9, uh, we have here. It says, the Lord gave me, Moses, this, Deuteronomy is called the second law. It's, uh, they've been 40 years in the wilderness. They've got all the other law. You're going in the promised land. God says, let me give you a review. Teachers like to review. Review is good. It helps you remember. And uh, so, so the, the review is happening. He's getting ready to go in the promised land. And he goes back. Moses is talking. The Lord gave me two tablets of stone written by the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken with you at the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. God had been speaking to them, and they were scared. They said, God, don't, don't talk to us anymore. Speak through Moses and whenever. But he says, you guys heard and whenever. And I wrote those things down. And God wrote it first time, and I wrecked them. And then I had to write the second part after he wrote the Ten Commandments. And so that seems to be in verse 17 then, uh, there we have, and I took hold of the two tablets and I threw them from my hands and smashed them before your eyes. Now they didn't know that those were the commandments of God necessarily when he smashed them before their eyes. But he reminds them because he told them after that was commandments from the word of God. I got to go up there. And he says, I smashed those. He's reminding them what he went through. Remember our communion service, God says, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. You had to eat a bitter herb with that lamb. And the bitter herb was to think of the evil in whatever part. And our communion service were always mindful on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He took that bread. And he's sitting there waiting for Judas to go out and betray him and whatever. And he broke the bread in, and gave it to us as an example to remember what he's done. And here God wants to review before we go in the promised land that the word I had was written by the finger of God. It talks of his greatness. It reminds them of his power. And they, of course, they had so many examples of God's power, but they kept thumbing their nose at it. And, uh, you, you know, uh, where's Moses gone? Forty days. That's not a long time. It is if you're sitting in jail. I get to go there this morning. Forty minutes is a long time in jail. But 40 years, and God reminded them again. And Moses reminded them, I smashed those tablets because of you people. Be careful in our lives. God goes to a lot of work, and he's dis not disheartened physically like us, but he gets angry when his people um, cause the word of God to be broken. Let's go on to our last point. There are other works by the finger of God. Other works by the finger of God? Yeah. John chapter 8, we have a story, fairly well known. And here we have, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery. In the earlier part of that chapter, as you read it, says that they caught a woman in adultery and they came because they wanted to test Jesus and see what he would do. So they caught this woman. They says, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. In the very act. And now in the law, Moses commanded us that such women should be stoned. When you go back in that law in the Old Testament, it seems there's a law if somebody like Mary was a virgin betrothed to somebody and all of a sudden found to be caught in an adulterous situation, that person could be stoned. And that's why the story of the Christmas with Joseph was so important, whatever. Um, the other part of the law, anybody caught in adultery that was married to somebody, both of them were brought, both of them were stoned. They've brought this woman. This woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. And now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say, they say to Jesus? They were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. 
Jesus stooped down with his finger and with his finger wrote on the ground. You say, other writings by God? Yeah, we say Jesus is God. He's God in the flesh. He's God come down. He's Emmanuel, God with us. I call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He's the Savior, and he's God in the flesh. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away our sin. Angels can't take away our sin. It's got to be God come down. And he stepped down in time in the person of Jesus. We'll celebrate that starting next week. Uh, Jesus stepping into time, the Son of God stepping into time. And now some years later, 30-some years later, he's up and he's dealing with people. And they try to trick him up. They want a reason to kill him. And they bring this woman, and Jesus stooped down. Did he write words? Did he draw art? Doodle art, if you want. It's a big thing. You're sitting there talking to somebody, doodling. Karen's famous for that, or she's talking to her sister on the phone. She can draw a whole artist thing, whatever. Can we doodle art? He wrote with his finger. So Jesus stooped down, wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up. That's a dangerous thing. You get God straightening up in front of you. And he straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. What are you going to do about this, Jesus? This lady was caught in the very act of adultery. He's down there writing you. What, did you not hear us? She was caught in the very act. You know the law of Moses. You, know, you seem like you know so much. You know the law of Moses. She's supposed to be stoned. So he straightens up and he says, here's the deal. Whoever of you who has no sin, you throw the first stone. There's the stones right there. Have at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Doodling. One scholar says there's a, a thinking out there that he, he was writing the names of the guys amongst these people that were right there who had been with this woman. He says that's no biblical history of it, whatever, but there's that idea. But he was writing something down because all of a sudden when he said that, from the best of them, to the oldest and most senior, they all started to leave. He's writing. Is he writing their names? You decide. Is he just doodling, make doodle art? But he says, whoever has no sin, you throw the first stone. And the light started to come on. He had them pinned. They're trying to trip him up, and he trips them up. And that's what God will do if you try to mess with him. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone. And he was left. So they were all gone, and he was left alone. And the woman, where she was, uh, in the center of the court, uh, there she was alone with Jesus there alone. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, uh, where, are your, uh, where are your accusers? Where are they? Did no one condemn you? Obviously nobody threw rocks. Did no one condemn you? There's a song written, No man condemns you, and neither do I. Because Jesus says that in the next verse. He says, nobody condemns you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. The rationale there from go and sin no more doesn't mean be perfect. It means stop, and the Greek is the idea. Stop what you're doing. Why? Because this adultery, and it doesn't, it's not good. It's not healthy. And then whatever. Uh, Paul says that they, if there's all kinds of sins against your body. Alcoholism, drug addiction, and all those things are against your body in a way. But there's a special way that se sexual immorality is against your body. And Paul says we're, we're vessels of honor to, go, to God. So he says, go and, and stop doing this, honey. Why? Because it's not good for you. Jesus had, Jesus had a number of women that followed him and ministered to him and was ever collected in, in his pile of disciples. I'm sure this little lady became one of those followers. I'm sure those women took her in and said, you don't have to do that. We can, we can sell beads and we can make bread and we can help the poor and you follow along and Jesus can multiply stuff and do whatever. You don't have to do that lifestyle anymore. Never use sin as an acceptable thing because you can't get by. It becomes God's problem if you say to him, I can't do anything else. Yes, you can. And you say to Jesus, if he says don't do this, the word of God says don't do this, you've got to come and trust him. If you need a hamper from Pastor Bill, we got hampers. God can give you a job other than the one you got. The writing by the finger of God says, 
Those who have no other gods before me. And when you argue that God can't take care of you and whatever, you've made yourself a God that instead of God being God. You see, he's committed to the protective care of his child. You become his child, and you become his problem. You become his child, you become his problem, and he don't have any problem. He don't have any problem dealing with stuff. And so the finger of God wrote it in the sand. Nobody condemns you. Neither do I, he says. Please get your head around that. No man condemns you. Jesus says, neither do I. And the finger of God was writing in the sand while he's, she's dealing with her situation. Colossians 2, verse 14 says, Colossians 2, 14. Did I give you that one? <laughs> okay, I must have forgot to give you that. It just says, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The law says you're supposed to be stoned. But Jesus says no man condemns you because they couldn't throw rocks because they weren't without sin. And he says, I don't condemn you. And your sin was taken and nailed to my cross. And it's, heavy, it's canceled out, the certificate of debt, consisting of degrees. You, you owe bills and whatever, and they're canceled out, consisting of degrees against us. Those things are piled up or whatever, the bills and all those things. And Jesus says, I can help as you follow me. And those things are hostile to us, and they take away our joy. They, they make us act out and whatever, and they're hostile to us. And he's taken it out of the way, and he's nailed it to his cross. No man condemns you, neither do I, Jesus says as he rolled in the sand with his finger as the Son of God. Last verse. Two last verses like. Luke eleven twenty. Jesus says, If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If I cast out demons by the finger of God. Now, how does he cast out demons by the finger of God? Well, I think it's this way. He just takes and he shoots with his finger like crokinole. Bing, you're out of the game. Bing, you're out of here. There's nothing for God. To, and we see Jesus he just spoke to the demons and they were cast out. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, flick them away like that. However else he wants to say, do it. I couldn't figure any other reason to dig further on that. He says, I cast out demons by the finger of God. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. They're asking you, you throw out demons, by, by you're, the, you're the head demon. Jesus, well, that's smart. <laughs> Satan stands against himself. I'm going around healing people with demonic powers and whatever. I'm healing them. And if Satan fights against Satan, Satan's going to lose. Well, that was dumb on your part, you guys. He says, so if I cast out demons by the finger of God, I'm showing you the kingdom of God has come in front of you talking to the Jewish people. Our last verse now says Matthew 12, 28. Here's how he deals with demons. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He says, my finger flicks them away, but really it's the Spirit of God. When, he, when he, the demon comes and says, hey, what have I got to do, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are. That's the demons talking. And Jesus says, come out of him. And, uh, well, don't throw us in the, uh, don't just cast us in the sea. Uh, send us into the pigs. And he puts them in the pigs, and then the pigs all run down in the sea. There seems to be something in Scripture about demons and water, and they all drown. The pigs did, anyhow. And you can drown a demon. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God says, I don't condemn you. The finger of God wrote on stones and gave the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Your neighbor is yourself. And when we do those things, no, that's the finger of God writing to us. He wrote in the sand. And then he stands and says, I do not condemn you. I know your story. The finger of God flicks out demons. By his spirit, he just tells them to step aside. I got work to do. I got work to do. God's finger wrote the law. God's finger doodled art or wrote names. God's finger can throw away demons. But it's a work of his spirit that says, I want you to know who I am. I want to have a relationship with you. My Father and I will come and live in you. He says, as you realize you're a sinner that needs help and you ask Jesus to come into your heart. And when you do that, my Father and I come and live in your heart. A little friend of mine one time, my first pastor's uh, kid, 
four years old. And she had a chest cold. Mom was rubbing some Vicks or something on her chest. She said, Mommy, Mommy, be careful. Be careful. Don't rub Jesus out of my heart. Child can catch on. The Spirit of God can live in your heart. That's his desire. He wrote with a finger on stone, physically. They smashed those physical ones. But the book tells you about the God who is a spirit and giving you his word and wants you to follow it. And as you do, you enter the kingdom of God and you have a relationship with him and the promise of eternal life and all those things. He flicks out demons. He says you're not condemned. He helps you understand when others take the sword and slash you down. And he meets you in your grief and he helps you. For any tears that you have, he says, for those tears I die. Our closing hymn is on the screen, Ancient Words. The Word of God, quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing you to this, asunder, tearing asunder of spirit and such. Then I'll dismiss us in prayer after we sing, please. couple of days. Just remember them in prayer, please, if you would. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that despite the fact that your, your words are ancient, the words we read in the Bible, they are so um, applicable um, and relevant to us today, um, and we thank you that we can depend on them. Lord, and your words are, are personalized to us. Um, I pray that we would uh, we would look at ourselves and, and, and uh, consider how we are using them, uh, whether to if we're using them to cut people down or to sharpen our character. Lord, I pray that we would recognize that in ourselves this week. Um, Lord, we know that your words remind us um, of your love for righteousness and obedience, as we saw um, in Exodus. Uh, and later, Jesus, your, your writings reminded us of your grace and your forgiveness. And yet both are important to you. And, uh, and for both, we need your spirit. And so we, because we know that we are sinners and you're a holy God. Father, we want to lift up this darkness to you um, as, as they're recovering, and we just pray for John, and uh, that you give him strength, give him health, um, give him your peace and encouragement, Lord, this week, um, that you, you would just touch him with your hand. Go with uh, each one of us, uh, each home that's represented and family um, that's listening in, and, and uh, that uh, just could, could be an encouraging word for them this week, um, and that you would bless them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.